الحمد لله وكفى وسلاما على عباده الذين اصطفى ما بعد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أم كنتم شهداء إذ حضر يعقوب الموت إذ قال لبنيه ما تعبدون من بعدي قالوا نعبد إلهك وإله آبائك إبراهيم وإسماعيل وإسحاق إله واحدة ونحن له مسلمون صدق الله العظيم Honorable sisters listening, a couple of years back, I had the opportunity of attending a seminar which happened at a place called Harakay. It was a seminar which was held by an organization called MEND, and they had called dignitaries from across the world to come to the stage and speak on Islam and other topics. So, shuyukh like Shaykh Naaman Ali Khan, Shaykh Umar Khadi, and others, they came and they spoke very eloquently on the subject which they were given. Then Shaykh Umar Suleiman came on the stage and he spoke on the topic on interfaith. And again, he spoke very eloquently on the topic of interfaith. And as we are all aware, Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an was able to make a lot of effort within the society and within the society of non-Muslims because of the interfaith work. Because in his time, two-thirds of Byzantine Empire and Sasanian Empire had been conquered. So the amount of interfaith work which he was able to do was a lot. And one of the things which Shaykh Umar Suleiman mentioned whilst he was delivering this talk, he asked this question to the congregation. That what was the greatest contribution of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala So again, many people in the congregation said different answers. Some said the zakah, some said the, uh, the way he distributed uh, funds, others said the welfare system. And many people gave their own uh, reasons as to why they thought Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala was a person like Umar radiallahu ta'ala But he said, no to all the answers. He said, no, 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 no. And then after he said that the greatest achievement of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala was not that he did the welfare system or he created the zakah system or other systems, no. But the greatest achievement of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala was producing and nourishing a son like Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala. And when I heard that, I was awestruck. That when was the last time we actually thought of our child being an asset. And here, this Shaykh is mentioning that the greatest achievement of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an was producing a son like Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. And my sisters, this is what we need to learn. That the greatest asset which we have are not the properties or the money or the bank balance which we have, no. The greatest asset which we have is our children. And what is an asset? Asset is something which is tangible or intangible, but which gives value. The asset of worldly things, of worldly matters, will diminish, will finish, will terminate. However, this asset, our children, will remain forever and ever. It is stated that when a person passes away from this world, then his connection, he loses connection with this world. There's no connection between that person and this world. To such an extent, the two of the most closest things which is associated with the person, his name and his possession, even that connection is terminated. That when a person passes away, his possession is automatically transferred to his inheritors. And his name, which stayed with him from birth till the end, even that name is wiped out. This is why we see that when a person passes away, people start referring to that person as body. When, when will they uh, release the body? Bring the deceased closer. Put the deceased carefully. Even the name is wiped out. However, Prophet said, all connection terminates. However, there is one type of connection, there is one type of relationship, which even after a person passes away from this world, it remains. And that relation, that connection, is between a father and his son, is between a mother and her son. This connection is so strong that it's it stays in this world and it, and it remains in the hereafter as well. This is why Prophet ﷺ once mentioned in a hadith that, they, that 
a, a father will be elevated, his status will be elevated in Jannah. So he will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why is my status being elevated in Jannah? Because of what action? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reply that your particular son is asking forgiveness for you. And because of his asking forgiveness in this world, I am elevating your status here. It is stated regarding, uh, some say this incident occurred with Hazrat Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, and others have mentioned other scholars that this scholar was passing a grave and this particular grave was being punished. After a couple, after a couple of years, this sheikh went past the same grave again and this time he saw that the punishment had been afflicted. So he asked and he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when I went across this grave a couple of years back, this person was being punished. And now the punishment has been lifted. What was the reason? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied, that oh person, when this person passed away, he left a young child. He couldn't speak, he couldn't do anything. But today he's reached that age that he could be able to speak, he's able to recite the Quran. And today he's read the first time, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most beneficent. How can I punish the father of that son who is saying that I am the most merciful? So my sisters, this connection which we have between a mother and her child is a very strong connection and a very great asset. So like I was saying before, that every asset is called an asset because it produces value with monetary, with property, you pump money, and with that money, the value increases. But what about our children? How and how will our children's value increase? Then scholars say that by nourishing them, by raising them properly. This is how their value will increase. So a question arises, when does nourishing, raising a child start from? Does it start from the age of four? Does it start from the age of two? Does it start from the age when a child is in her mother's womb? No. Scholar states it neither starts from the age of four. It neither starts from the age of two. It neither starts from the age when the child is in her mother's womb. It starts well before that. Scholar states that when a person is single and she is looking for a husband, the nourishing and the raising of the child starts from there. Why? Because the husband which you are looking for, the person you are looking for, you are not only looking for a husband, but you are actually looking for a father too. Because that person who you, who you will marry will be the father of your child. So when picking or when choosing a husband, make sure that you don't be selfish and look for your own gain, but also look for your child's gain. That will this person be good for my, for my children? And this is very important. This is why Prophet Sallallahu said that when a person gets married, he gets married because of four things. Either of the wealth, either because of lineage, either because of beauty, or either because of deed. And then Prophet Sallallahu then said that if you have to choose a deeny person, choose a righteous person. Question arises why? Because lineage, if you choose someone for lineage, then the impact, the benefit of that is for the parents. The parents will say, Alhamdulillah, my daughter is getting married to, uh, to this family, uh, to this uh, great family. So the lineage, uh, the, they will benefit. The beauty, who will benefit? The, the wife will benefit. Because uh, the beauty of the husband, no one else will benefit. It's the wife who will benefit. The wealth of the husband, who will benefit? The, the husband himself. Because it's his wealth, he, he can distribute it to whoever he wishes. However, deen, righteousness of a husband, not only will he benefit, not only will the wife benefit, but everyone, even the children will benefit. This is why it is stated that a father is an, a child is an extension, a, a child is an ex extension of his father. And the, fa and the characteristic of the father will be presented and is normally presented 
in a child's life. This is why it is very important that when we go out to look for a, a husband, we look for someone who has good, who has got good character, who is deen, who is deeny, who has got the mentality of deen. When I say deen, I don't want people to have this misconception that uh, deen only means a person who is salah and who is uh, uh, who doesn't go out, because then people start thinking, no, I don't want to get married to this person. No. What does deen mean? Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, "The inna min akmal al-mu'minin iman an ahsanuhum khuluqan wa altafuhum bi ahlihi." That the greatest deeny person, the greatest imani person, is that person who has good character and who is good with his family. This is deen. This is when when I say that I look for a deeny person, this is who a person should be looking for. A person who's got good character. Why? Because the 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 beauty will fade away, but the character of the person will remain forever and ever. So the nourishing of our children starts well before a child is born. When a person is going out to look, this is the time when a person should start thinking about uh, uh, the child which will be born. And, and this has great impact on, on the child. This is why in a, uh, it, uh, there are many incidents which highlights the important meaning the importance of 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 great of of those people who who had impact on their children and mainly it's the mothers who had the greatest impact on their children and they were the forebearers of Islam. When there are many incidents, one incident which I came across is of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. It is stated when the in the time of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, Islam had conquered many two thirds of Byzantine. The Sasanian Empire was conquered, and he, he was an Amirul Mu'minin. Who is an Amirul Mu'minin? Amirul in in an Islamic state, there is no one, and there is no honor which is given to a person more than that of Amirul Mu'minin. There is no status above an Amirul Mu'minin. So when a person is Amirul Mu'minin, meaning like Hazrat Umar radiAllahu Taala, surely and those people who came up, surely when a person is uh, in that, uh, uh, his 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 part of that royal family, then obviously he will want his child to be married and to wed a person who is similar. But let's look at the life of Umar radiallahu ta'ala now. He has conquered territories after territories. It is stated that his 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 territory was across the two third Byzantine Sasanian. If someone was to calculate that, that's approximately. 2.2 million square miles. That's how much land he he had conquered. He, he was uh, ruling. 2.2 million square miles. England is about 94, 94, 94,000 square miles. So if you were to equate a 22 times greater than the land of the UK, this is how much Umar radiallahu ta'ala who ruled. It is stated that one day he was going out and he he was with Hazrat Abbas radiallahu Hazrat Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala and he came across uh, a little uh, tent and in that tent he overheard the conversation between a mother and her child the mother was saying the oh child you bought very little milk today tomorrow we need to go to market and sell this milk but you bought so little how are you going to uh, gain money from this milk so, oh, oh daughter, I want you to add milk. I want you to add water so that tomorrow it seems like that there's a lot of milk with us and we can get more money. What was the reply of this daughter? She said, oh mother, yes, before Islam, we used to do all these things. But after becoming Muslim, it is against Islam to add water into milk and to deceive people. She said, do this, oh daughter. Amir al-Mu'minin is not here. How will he be able to find out that we've done this? She said, no, I will not do this. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala, without mentioning anything, he overheard this conversation, he left. And then it is stated uh, in the history books that the next day he sent to one of his companions, that I want you to go to this particular tent and I want you to buy that milk. And the reason he wanted to buy the milk was to see whether she had actually added water or not. The milk was bought and Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala who tested the milk and it was pure. To this, he understood 
that that daughter had not uh, accepted and had not deceived. So what does he do? He he tells his companion that this particular incident happened last night, and uh, deceiving is a is a is a is a major crime. So I want I want you to summon the 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 mother and the daughter into court. So the mother came, obviously she came trembling because she knew that she was in the wrong. And then the da daughter came. The daughter, as it stated, was she was bold. She was confident because she was in the wrong. They both came and the court case happened. And when it came to judge, to rule the mother, as Umar radiallahu ta'ala answered, that I would have punished you, but because of your loyal daughter, I will forgive you, O mother, you can go. And then he looked to that girl and said, Oh girl, how can I pay you? And the companions who were there, they said, pay her some money. Meaning this is a gift, this is something which you could pay her with. As pay her with. As Umar radiallahu ta'ala and replied, No, I will not pay her with money. I will pay her with something greater than money. And then he called three of his sons, Abdullah and Abdul, Rah Abdul Rahman, they were already married. So Asim radiallahu ta'ala wasn't married. So he called Asim and he said to Asim, Oh Asim, are you prepared? Are you ready to get married to this girl? This milk made girl who is so poor, Baza Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu knew that the nourishing of a child is not to do with wealth, is not to do with beauty, but the nourishing of a child is to do with the characteristic of a person. And what happens? Asim radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he marries uh, this girl. And after, when they get married, they have a daughter and they name that daughter Umm Asim. And Umm Asim has a child. And that child, who was that child? That child was Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahmatullahi alayhi. Who was Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahmatullahi alayhi? It is stated that after the four Khulafa, as Abu Bakr, as Umar, as Usman, as Ali, the Umayyad destiny remained for 94 years, the Abbasids, and many destiny remain. If there was one person whose rule was greater than any other rulership, then it was Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahmatullahi alayhi. Now within, he only stayed in power for 30 months, but he changed the whole territory of Islam. It is stated that within 30 months, he did so much work within this territory that there wasn't even a single person who was left to, uh, to receive zakah money. So obviously we will listen to the stories of Umar bin Abdul Aziz, but little would we ever investigate or know that Umar bin Abdul Aziz became Umar bin Abdul Aziz because of the sacrifice, because of the characteristic of her mom, and her mom was the son of uh, Asim radiallahu ta'ala. So uh, nourishing of a child or nourishing of our child will start before even us getting married. So this is the baseline. So once a person gets married, then what are the rules and duties? How can a, a mother uh, raise her child uh, in the 21st century? Then this topic is a huge topic. Meaning just a couple of weeks back, uh, I was uh, uh, in a course which was held by Mali Yassadatsab on raising children. And that course was about four hours long. And even after that four hours, it seemed like uh, uh, we had not touched upon this topic. So in the uh, uh, the little time which I have, I don't think I'll be able to just to do justice on this topic, that how can we raise our children in the 21st century? So I was looking in the books of history, that is there any, uh, uh, any advice which our scholars have given? Because this topic, what we have to remember, is this topic is not a theory topic. This topic is a practical topic. It's a topic of experience. So I'll give you an example. If a, if a lecture was to be held, and the lecturer, and the, and the topic of the lecture was how to become a millionaire, for example, how to become a millionaire. And the lecturer was a poor person, was a bankrupt person. Do you think anyone would take benefit or would take heed from this person? No. Although he might have read all the books of business, but 
When it comes to money, it's not theory, it's practical. Similarly, when it comes to nourishing, when it comes to raising children, yes, there are theory out there. But the main thing is, what has, what has those people who have actually showed that their children have excelled in deen and dunya, what was the practical advice given by them? That will work more. Then if you look in history from Adam alayhi salatu wasalam to the last person, then there is no one who could have given better nourishment than Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam. Why? Because he was inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And then the, the daughters of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam, because they would have mirrored they would have copied how Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam nourished them, and they would have nourished their children according to how Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam nourished them. Then we look in the life of Hazrat Fatima and Hazrat Ali radiyallahu taala. Why? Because they produced the like of Hazrat Hassan and Hazrat Hussein radiyallahu taala. And regarding Hazrat Hassan and Hazrat Hussein radiyallahu taala, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself gave a certificate. The Sayyida Shababi Ahli Jannah, they will be the leaders of all the youngest, youngsters in Jannah al Firdaus. So, the certificate of them being raised as Islamic was given by Prophet by saying Sayyida Shababi Ahli Jannah. So, let's look and let's look in the advice of Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala. Now, what did Ali radiallahu ta'ala say regarding nourishing children? Then we find one very beautiful quote which he once mentioned regarding raising children. He said, and this is his quote, that when a person, when a boy or when a girl is born, then remember this, seven, seven, seven. And he said, that first seven years, play with them. Set, second seven years from seven to 14, teach them. And from 14 to 21, advise them and befriend them. And this is a principle which was laid by Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala which in the 21st century, psychologists studying this have approved of this formation. That for the first seven years, it is very important that we play, we bond with our children. Because they have been born. They have come in this world and the only emotional thing which they know is crying. So their toolbox, psychology says, their toolbox is empty. They don't know anything. Whose job it is to teach them things is their parents. But first, don't teach them. Play with them. Bond with them. Have fun time with them. So that the bond stays with a mother and her child. So for the first seven years, it is stated that a person should uh, a play, should have physical activities with uh, her child. And not just physical activities, but uh, other, uh, other non-physical activities as well is good. Psychology says that why are non-physical activities are good as well? So for example, they say that because they've come in this world, they, their emotion, they can't link their emotions, their happiness, their sadness, uh, uh, they can't be linked. So, for example, reading books is good. So, when a person is reading book, when a, when a when a mother is reading book with a child, then explain to your child that look, this person is sad. Why is he sad? Why is this person sad? And link that emotional sadness so that when your child becomes sad, she understands when does a person become sad. When a person when reading a book, for example, and uh, the person is, has become angry, then teach them what anger means, the emotion of anger. So that when you become angry at your child, she automatically understands what anger means. Because there, as I was saying, their toolbox is empty. Whatever we will feed them, whatever we will bond, whatever we will teach them at this stage, it will stay with them. So Zali radiallahu ta'ala would say, first seven years, Play with them, bond with them, connect this, have this connection with them. And then Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala then said that after that, once the bond is done, once you've played with them, once you have 
a good interaction with your child, now is time from 7 to 14 to teach them. Because they are blank now. In terms of their knowledge, is blank. Teach them. Whatever you will teach them, they will soak in. This is why, if you look in the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say? When he came to teaching namaz to our children, he said that when a child reaches the age of seven, teach them salah. Why? Because they are blank. Whatever you will teach them, they will now grasp. And do not limit yourself. Do not, th do not think that, oh, if I teach them too much, uh, they will forget. No, no, no. I have got a friend who is a doctor. He was telling me that my son, he's about 11 years old. He's memorized, I don't know how many hadith books by memory. And he was telling me, he's only 11 years old. If I was to bring my child and was to put him in one corner, and if I was to bring 20 scholars on one side, I think my son would win the debate. Because he's memorized all the hadith books. So why? Because he's a psychologist himself. And he's a... So, and he works. So he understands... The, there's no limit when it comes to teaching our children there's no limit they, they can learn whatever you will teach them but make sure whatever we teach our children is good and the greatest thing which we could teach them at this age is good character so give them the Islamic knowledge the Islamic knowledge theory is given uh, within the four corners of the madrasas that's just theory Islam is not theory Islam is practical so that practical needs to be taught within the homes this is why many parents, they complain that our daughter, our son went to madrasa and it's still the same. Why? Because the theory was taught within the four corners. Yes, the theory was taught. But practical without theory is no good. So the, the practical element, reading salah, being good with your parents, uh, reading your uh, duas, being good with your neighbors, how can that be taught? Or how can that be done practically in the four corners? within the four confinement of madrasas, it can't be. So this is why it is very important that when a child, meaning we should be grateful that makatiba are out there, that they've at least done this part of the job, easy for us, that they've given them the theory aspect. Now when they come home, it is our duty that the theory which they've learned in madrasa of being good with their neighbors. So when the time of Eid comes, or not even the time of Eid, any other time, when it's time to give some food, tell your child, that here, uh, we, you've learned this in Madrasa, I want you to do this practically. And give him the order of uh, giving food to the neighbor and explaining why we are doing this. So it's our duty as parents that whatever they've learned in Madrasa, we, we practically show them how this is done and how this is done in, uh, in the world out there. Otherwise, what will happen is they will leave Madrasa and they will only have theory. And that theory in this day and age is not enough to protect a person's deen. So between the seven and, between the age of seven and fourteen, theory in madrasa and practical uh, within uh, home. And as I was saying, the best thing which a person can uh, teach uh, her child is good character, good manners. And teach whatever you, you want to teach. Even the most little basic things, teach them. So for example, if your child is going, has gone uh, to your cousin's house and she's saying A or she's saying uh, uncle to everyone, explain to her that this is uh, Mama. You call, this, you call him Muhammad Mama. You call him Bilal for you. This is, and, and make them realize that these are our cousins. This is, this, they, these are how these people are related to me. And they should know this. So even the most simplest thing, most trivial thing, teach them uh, so that uh, between the age 7 and 14. So after the bond is done from the age of, uh, till the age of 7, now you've taught them from 7 to 14. Now from uh, Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala who said from 14 to 21, befriend them and advise them. Because now they are on an autopilot. Autopilot meaning they've learned everything. Now they're just going through life. And they will maneuver, they will change their lanes, they will go from here to there. So now is the time to advise them. Whenever they're going off the track, advise them. So they come back onto track. 
And this advice will only happen if they've got connection with this, with this, if they've got attachment with this. Otherwise, what will happen is they will not listen to us. And we will end up screaming and we will end up thinking that why they're not listening to us. Because that attachment, which should have been there before, was not made. So why are they going to listen to us? So this way is very important that all these things are done well before, so that when they reach this age, they take advice from us. Not only advice, and the greatest advice which they can take from us is being a good role model. Yeah, be, be a good role model. Because they've got the bond, they've uh, learned a practical, now they want to see that practical aspect. And they will see this practical aspect from their parents. So if a mother or if a father is telling and is ordering his child, uh, oh my child, go for namaz, and he goes for salah, and then he comes back after 10 minutes and he sees his father on the sofa. So psychologically he'll be thinking, that what's this? I've been, I've been taught this, but practically he's not doing this. This subconsciously won't have any effect at that time, but for lo later in his stage, this will have an effect. Now, wait a minute, my father's not doing this, so why am I doing this? So whatever they've been taught, they, that will be wiped out. So at this age, be a good role model. Be a good role model, meaning however you want your child to be, be like that. So if any time, uh, a time comes when, when you have to lie, then think to yourself, do, do, do I want my child to lie? No, let's not lie. So however you, you want your child to be, be a role model of that. And the greatest role model is advising them. At every stage of their life, from 14 to 21, and even after that, advise them. And uh, many parents uh, complain, and they, they tell us that my child is not listening, and I scream at him, and I do this. But scholars say that yes, uh, to, to a degree, a person is allowed to raise their voice, to be angry. But what, one thing we need to remember, is gentleness, is soft spoken words have will have more longer effect on our child than shouting and screaming at them. You know, who could be the most closest to Prophet Sallallahu The Sahabas. Meaning they gave their, if there was one person who someone would give their life to, it would have been, and it was the Sahabas. He, they gave their life for Prophet Sallallahu Whatever Prophet Sallallahu said, they did. And they actually gave their life. To Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But what does Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tell Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even you, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the in fourth para, Walau kunta fazlan gharizal al qalb, lan fazlu min hawli. The O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even you, if you were hard hearted, in Tafsir ibn Kasir, he said, What does hard heartedness mean? That if you spoke angrily, not gently, these people who are in front of you, the likes of Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Ali, they would learn fadlu, they would disperse from you. Who has been told to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that even if you have this quality of, of, of hard-heartedness, of not being gentle, then these people would disperse from you. And this again comes in the Holy Quran when we listen to the story of Hazrat Musa Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. Hazrat Musa Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, he's going to Fir'aun. Who is Fir'aun? You know, in the entire a time from Adam alayhi salatu wasalam till the end, only a couple of people have actually made da'wah that they were God. And one of them is Fir'aun. And not only God, I am the greatest of the Lord. So you can imagine the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this person is actually not only saying he's God, but he's the greatest of God. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs and orders the Musa alayhi salam, O oh, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, I want you for the first time because he left the palace and he lived in Madian. So after this, it was the first time of him going to meet Fir'aun. So he tells Musa, Oh Musa, alayhi salatu I want you to go and speak to Fir'aun. As Musa alayhi salatu says to Fir'aun and says to Allah, Oh Allah, how can I go? I've got this stuttering problem. Oh Allah, make my brother a partner. So Allah subhanahu wa accepts this dua. And now they're going. And look at the hidayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From all the hidayahs, from all the advices which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have given as a Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. You know, he could have said, when you go to Musa Fir'aun, say this, say this, make sure uh, this is uh, how you debate. But nothing is mentioned. 
Allah says in 16 Farah, only one advice was given to Musa, the O Musa and Harun. When you go and when you confront Fir'aun for the first time, then فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلَ اللَّيْنَ Make sure your speech is gentle. فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلَ اللَّيْنَ Layin means gentle, soft. Make sure when you speak, your words are soft. Your words are gentle. Because this will have a profound effect on the person opposite you. So, uh, as, I was as I was mentioned before, uh, yes, uh, raising our voice uh, uh, will have a shorter uh, uh, benefit. But advice in terms of being gentle, being uh, uh, sincere, uh, will have a longer impact. And what we have to remember is not only advice, but how we treat them will have a longer uh, effect on them as well. I came across this incident that uh, it's a very beautiful incident of, a, of, a, of this father. He had about four or five children and each one of them became a doctor, one became a teacher, one became a, uh, an ophthalmologist and they grew, they, they got married, they had children and one day this father thought to himself, let me call my sons over. So they all came and they all sat in the sitting room and the father then asked this question, oh my sons, you have all gathered here today together and mashallah, you are all professionals. I want you to ask, I want to ask this question, that what made you, what inspired you to become a doctor? What inspired you to become a teacher? So the eldest said that, oh father, my friends inspired me to become this. Then the next person, the next son said, oh my father, I was reading this book and that book inspired me to become like this. And, and then he asked Bilal, oh Bilal, what inspired you to become a teacher? And he said, oh father, you inspired me. So his father said, me? How did I inspire you? inspired you to become a teacher. I'm not a teacher myself. He said, because of an incident which happened when we were young. If you remember, oh father, when we were young, things used to be stolen from our house. And we used to blame uh, cousins, friends who used to visit our house. But actually it was me who was stealing. And one day what happened? Like this, how we are sitting here. We were once sat in the room. And eldest brother had money in his pocket. So I secretly went and I stole that money. And I put it in my pocket. And the eldest brother, he found out. And then he said, the, Oh father, someone has just stolen money from my pocket. And because no one had gone out from that room and no one had come in, you said, the, Oh my sons, today we're going to find out who this uh, thief is. Because no one has gone out and no one has come in. So own up, who has stolen this money? And no one owned up. And then you said, that I want everyone to close your eyes and, and stand next to that wall. And... I want to check everyone's pocket. So the father checked the eldest person's pocket and then the second and then the third. And then when it came for my turn, you checked my pocket and the money came out. And then the fourth and the fifth. And then you said, open your eyes. And then you said, that I have found the thief. Everyone go now. Oh my father, it is that day and today you didn't mention this incident and you didn't say anything to me. That inspired me so much that if my father can do something like this, then I want to inspire other people. And I then decided that I want to inspire students. And that's how I've become a teacher. So, sisters listening, one of the greatest thing is gentle. And then after that, advise them uh, and be a, cool, be a good role model. And until when, uh, this question also comes, the until when does nourishing, raising our children ends? Does it end when the, uh, they become married? Does it end when they've started having children? When does it end? When do we actually stop thinking about our children? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the word of Quran, and these are the verses which I read in the, in the khutbah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers this question. That Yaqub alayhi salatu was salam, when he is passing away, he calls his children, to show that the nourishment and the raising of our children doesn't stop when they get married. Doesn't stop when they have their first child or their second, no. The raising and the fikr and the worry of our children remains until we pass away from this world. Because when Hazrat Yaqub passed away, Allah SWT says in the Holy Quran, Am kuntum shuhada'a il hadri Yaqub al maut That when Yaqub was passing away, what did he do? He called his sons over. 
Who, who, were they? who were they sons? They were Anbiya. Hazrat Yusuf Al -Islam was a Nabi. They came in front of Yaqub Al Islam. Yaqub Al Islam is passing away. And what does he say? And, and what question does he ask his sons? Lam kuntum shuhadai that, oh my sons, when I pass away, who will you worship? He's not worrying about their money. He's not worrying about their life. The only worry is about their Iman. That, oh my sons, who will you worship after I pass away? And look at the reply, the sons. They said, Ma we will worship the Lord of Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At this, Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam felt content. That yes, this is the answer which I wanted to hear. So sisters, the nourishment of our children starts well before a person uh, uh, becomes married. And it ends when our soul departs from us. Now, in this uh, climate, obviously, many parents will have gone through this and will have done the Wahz Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu has said. And even then, even then, we will find our children going off track. And the couple of minutes which I've got, I just want to touch upon this. Because what we have to remember is, when, when a child reaches the age of 14, and as I said, they are on autopilot now, the only thing which will work with them is advising them now. But when a, when a pilot is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is driving that airplane, is on autopilot, the only time he will take control of his, uh, his steering or his control is when turbulence will come. If he doesn't take control when turbulence will come, the autopilot will not save them. Everyone will pass away and everyone will die. When a child is at 14, 15, 16, what are the turbulence which they will face? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there is only one type of turbulence, meaning there are many types, but there is one detrimental turbulence which they will face. And if you are not careful with this turbulence, then this will not only destroy him, this will not only destroy you, but the whole family will be destroyed in terms of the aspect. And that is bad environment. That is bad friends. And when I say bad friends, I'm going to say uh, attachment. Because nowadays, uh, uh, attachment, meaning attachment socially and online. Because even online gaming online is also a bad company. It's just that it's not physical, it's, it's online. But again, the same ruling applies. So what I'm trying to say is, at this stage, stage the turbulence is, are they getting themselves into bad company? Online, meaning are they spending their time as they should be online? And offline, who are their friends? <coughs> if a person does not take care of these two aspects, then what will happen? The turbulence will come. And they, the friends, our children, will, be, will attach themselves to these friends. And if these friends are bad, then this will lead our children to disarray and no matter how much we've done with them and how much uh, effort this turbulence is such that if we do not take care at that time it will destroy their life and it is upon us as parents that when we when we notice these changes so first of all it should be that we shouldn't even let them go, let, let them reach the stage so if our, children, if our child is young, don't give them mobile phones at this age. If you've given them no mobile phones and they're at the age of 12, 13, then have rules that after 10 o'clock, you're not allowed. Wi-Fi will be shut in our house. Or I, I don't want phones um, in your room. Yes, they will, uh, uh, they will become angry. They will uh, make a lot of fuss. But what you have to remember is, it is better that you take that first. It is better you take the anger now than, than regretting for the entire life. So control them at this age. You will be able to control them at this age. But if your child has reached the age where you feel that now it's very hard for me to control, because there are many parents like that who feel that it's, it's out of my control now. 
then what should be done? Then one advice would be is try to win their hearts. Because intellect, because what I want to say is addiction, you know, there are many smokers in the world. They will tell you that quitting smoking is really hard. You can't just shout at someone and they will quit. Addiction of game nowadays is a greater addiction than smoking. So if shouting and screaming doesn't stop a person smoking, then how will you ever stop a person who's got the addiction of gaming? This is why NHS, they have, I was just reading today, they have actually uh, categorized under the mental illness, they, they have different uh, wording. And gaming disorder from 2017 has become uh, uh, a, a mental illness according to, according to NHS. So if uh, as our child has reached this age and they are not listening to us, then one advice, one practical advice which I want to give is try to win their hearts. Meaning, uh, meaning uh, do things in order for the child or uh, for that youngster to become close to you. Do not do things which will make them abandon the house. Because just a couple of days back, uh, we, were, uh, we attended this session on prison. And Marshall, the, the chaplain over there, was saying that the majority of the people who end up in prison are, are who? Whose parents abandoned them. And they had nowhere to go and they ended up in prison. So one way is win their hearts. Because once you win a person's heart, then that person is yours. So you will have to, every parent is different. So you'll have to strategically plan the how can I win my young child or uh, maybe he's a, he's a teenager. How can I win his heart or he, uh, win her heart? Because once you win the heart, then they are yours. This is why it is stated that it is better to lose to lose a debate it is better to lose a debate and win the heart than to win the debate and lose the heart it is better to lose the debate and win the heart of that person than to win a debate and lose the heart why because once a person has the, the person's heart he has got some control over him now or over her now and once you have that control, then things will, inshallah, will become easy. Uh, like, uh, uh, I came across this incident, a very beautiful incident, that they, 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 they did this case study, that this very rich family, very rich family, they wanted to protect their, their house, they wanted to protect the garden. And because they had so much fortune what, and so much money, what they did was they had a guard dog. And guard dog, how you train them, that's how they will uh, uh, act. Even then, even after having a guard dog, what happened? The garden and the house was robbed. So they did a study that, how, how did this happen? Even after having a guard dog, they realized that what the robber was doing, they were coming every night and they were taming, they were feeding the dog. So when they, when they actually broke the, the walls of the garden, they had, uh, they had already tamed the dog and they had already won the, won the dog. So the dog on their, was on their side and they were able to do anything. So let's win the heart of our children. And Prophet ﷺ has mentioned that keep on reciting uh, and scholars have stated that Prophet Allah has taught us this dua. رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيُنْ That oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant my wife or my husband, meaning my spouse and my children, what qurrata ayun that they become a coolness of my eyes, because that's what every mother and every father are after. Qurrata ayun, coolness that when they go home or when they see the child, it brings coolness to their eyes. So we recite this dua frequently. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhuriyatina qurrata ayun wa jalna lil muttaqin mama. The short version should be could be Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhuriyatina qurrata ayun. And lastly, uh, this great Sheikh came from India, and I will conclude with this. Uh, he was in Leicester, and this particular father came, and he came inside the room, and he complained about his child that he's not listening, he's doing this, and this is a norm. And he complained a lot to this Sheikh, and this Sheikh then gave him a wazifa. 
and I will give this wazifa to all the people who are listening. The Sheikh said that in that case, you are not able to do anything, O oh Father. You are saying you don't have any control over your child. He said, no. He said, do this. Every day in the morning, you recite Surah Yasin. And after you finish reciting Surah Yasin, go in his room and blow in his room. Inshallah, the effect of Surah Yasin, which you have read, which you have blown in the room, will have some effect on your child. And inshallah, with that effect, you will see changes coming in your child. With these words, I conclude. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala firstly give me the tawfiq and everyone who are here, who are downstairs listening, that let us raise our children, how our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to raise. And let us be mindful of our children 24-7. And let us make dua. The last and final thing, let us make dua for our children. Duas can change destiny. Duas can change anything. You know, many people you think, what? Dua, dua, people keep on saying dua, dua. But actually, dua is the strongest thing which a person can have. You know, when a person, when a, when a, even we realize this, you know, when a, when a hospital says that you know, um, uh, we can't do anything, all the treatment which we were supposed to do, we've done. And that person comes home. What do we do? We make dua. Even we know, even we know that the dua, why are we making dua if we, if we ever thought that dua was weak? We know that hospitals can say anything. But something which is greater is dua. Because dua can change destiny. So let us make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, that, that let our children be on the right path. And if our children for some reason oh, they've gone astray, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring them back onto the right path. And let us be the role model and the role model of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillah.